Hey guys, welcome back again to Ken Tamplin Vocal Academy. Uh, I got a lot of requests for this one, and that is, how does the voice work? Or how does the singing voice actually work? Well, it's actually a pretty expansive subject, but I'm gonna try to break it down and simplify it to give you sort of a bird's eye view or a condensed version so that for those that um, benefit by thinking about how things work in their body, which will help them sing better, this will give you a better perspective on how these components work in concert with each other uh, to phonate or create sound, okay? The very first thing is the breath. Now, you've heard us a lot of people talk about the breath, the breath, the breath, or you know, um, diaphragmatic support and so on. So I'm not gonna get to talk about how diaphragmatic support, how to do it, refer to my video on diaphragmatic support because that will really help you. Well, the breath comes in through the pharynx, which is the throat, and goes down and passes through the larynx, which is the voice box, on into the trachea, which is the windpipe, down into the lung. Now, as we take a breath, like this, the lung expands with our rib cage. Now, there are muscle structures that help with this expansion. The very first one is what are called intercostal muscles within the rib cage itself. It's the thing that we eat when we eat baby back pork ribs. One of my favorite foods, actually, barbecued. Um, anyway, it helps with the expansion and contraction of the lung along with the diaphragm, which is the main muscle that helps um, contribute to this. So as this expansion and contraction happens, it splits into two tubes as it goes down into the lung. First, it goes into the, into the bronchi, and then it goes into the bronchioli, or bronchial lead, depending on how you want to pronounce it. And then that splits into smaller forms, which create air sacs throughout the lung, which is called the alveoli, or alveoli. Now, it's like, kind of like a honeycomb throughout the lung. And now, the lung is really fragile, so this rib cage plays a huge role in the protection of the lung. Directly underneath the rib cage of the lung, here, sits your diaphragm. Now, when I take my breath, the diaphragm contracts like this in a crescent moon kind of fashion. When I exhale, it comes back into sort of homeostasis or where it originated from in the same relaxation response. Now the rib cage opens up and then also contracts or collapses in a similar fashion, right? Well, it's really important because what we've learned is in singing, if we can expand the lung and keep the lung in an expanded state, when that contraction happens within the diaphragmatic support mechanism, we create a vacuum, a very powerful vacuum in the lung. And when we do that, we go, you know, instead of like me talking to you now going, hey, 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 and giving you, you know, this, hey, 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 that's kind of the maximum for my lung. If I come down here like this, and I use my whole abdominal cavity, we're gonna cover in a minute, and I go, hey, 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 and I have all this strength, I actually have incredible amount of a support mechanism. Now let me de demonstrate this on my guitar so you can see what I mean. So first is, let's assume that we're just taking in a breath and we're taking it in from the lung, and we have about this much what we call a snap of air. Okay, there's like that much strength in the lung, right? But if I create this vacuum and keep the rib cage in an expanded state while the diaphragm is contracted like this, it creates this crazy vacuum in the lung so that when I expunge or push through this amount of air from the diaphragm, I get this kind of sound. It's a snap. It's like this explosion of air, all right? So as we understand how to utilize this, and manipulate this or mitigate this amount of error, we can actually use it to our advantage, okay? Now, so there are several, mu several muscle structures that happen within, um, you know, we, have, we just talked about the diaphragm below the rib cage. There's also a diaphragm that sits, it's a second diaphragm that sits down around the pelvis area, around your hairline, if you know what I'm talking about, your pubic hairline, and that's a second diaphragm that also creates this effect. Well, there's another strong muscle structure called the transverse abdominis, and it goes straight through the core of your body. And it, you can feel it, because you take this breath, you're standing up straight, you take this breath and you go, hey, 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 hey! And you can literally feel it pushing out. It goes through the body and down through the spine. Now, there is the abdominal, now the abdominal oblique, there's an internal and external abdominal oblique muscle, and that combined with the rectus abdominis makes up the core of your abdomen, okay? And we can talk about all these different muscle structures. I don't think you're gonna memorize all this stuff anyway, it doesn't matter. Let's just call it our solar plexus or our abdomen. I like to just 
simplify things and have people really understand. Okay, so here's my abdomen. Now, when we take out, when we pull in the breath, let's say, hey, 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 you know, we're to, to try to phonate or get sound with this explosion of air, it's kind of like the feeling like you're going to the bathroom. Now, I've been saying this for like a decade and I'm seeing other people finally come out and repeat stuff that I've said, which is cool, but it's kind of like you're pushing down, going, I gotta go to the bathroom. Like you're pushing down this sensation. Now, this is very different, and I mean very different than people that do yoga, yoga and say, okay, I'm gonna take a yoga breath and I'm gonna inhale with the yoga breath and exhale with a relaxation response. It doesn't work that way for singing. Actually, the exhale isn't a relaxation response. We're actually using that to push ourselves, or to pull in, I should say, that bathroom effect, to pull in on the sounding, hey, like, you know, like someone's gonna hit you in the gut, let's say, and you kind of tuck in a little bit. Now, I'm not advocating building tension in the abdomen, and I'm not saying just do that all the time. That's not my point. But the point is, is if, as I say, you're going for a high note, we want equal pressure or equal resistance when we take a breath. So I go, hey, if I'm going, like kind of putting in equal pressure, it's kind of like an accordion where the accordion comes out like this, and then as we go, and we want to get a high note, we have to use equal resistance or equal air pressure within this abdominal structure, keeping the rib cage expanded so that we get the snap of air and then having this go through the trachea back into the larynx and for phonation or to create sound. Okay, now I want to move on to the pharynx because, okay, there's a lot to this. Um, I wanted to mention one other thing. People think of the larynx as its primary function is for singing or speaking, right? Well, that's actually patently false. Um, the primary function for the larynx is to maintain and control food and air, but predominantly food in this, in, in what I'm about to say, to keep that down in the esophagus so that you keep the, the fluids and the food and whatnot down in the esophagus. And we get something called the epiglottis that comes over, it's like a flap. And this flap controls whether or not food is gonna go into the esophagus from something I eat or drink, or if it's gonna pull back and it's gonna allow air down in the trachea. So the epiglottis, it's tied to the, the tongue, it actually controls or mitigates or referees what's supposed to happen between the trachea and the esophagus. Should it go down the windpipe? Should it go down um, into the food pipe, let's call it, right? So I wanna kinda of dispel that rumor because the second function of the larynx is to phonate or to create sound. So we need to understand that, like it's not just, you know, and by the way, if you wanna understand, you know, the, um, the larynx, it has nine cartilage, cartilages in it. One of them, you can see it's a protrusion, which we call the Adam's apple, which comes out from the larynx like this. But it's the larynx itself is, let's call it a housing or something that houses uh, our uh, vocal folds themselves. And I wanna talk about folds and cords because that's also another misnomer. But it, it holds the vocal folds inside of that, protects them, right? And then the vocal folds themselves are seated inside the larynx. So the larynx, is multifunctional and one of its functions is phonation or to create sound. All right, so the larynx is, it, you know, it's just, um, two things, by the way. I wanna talk about the pharynx and the larynx, but I wanna get back to the vocal folds themselves. People think of your vocal folds or chords like these two chords that go, ring, I play something on the guitar and it goes, nah, 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 and it resonates. But I'm gonna to get to resonators here in a second. Sorry, there's all these resonators that happen and we'll discuss this in a second, but these things are like, okay, there's these two chords and they go, da, 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 right? Well, actually the vocal folds aren't like that. The vocal folds themselves are hundreds of sinews of collagen, okay? Hundreds of sinews of collagen, and they come together with something in the center called the glottis. Now the glottis kind of looks like a V shape like this, and it gets closed down by a muscle group, and there's lots of muscle groups, and I'm not gonna get a chance to talk about all the muscle groups, but there's the arytenoid and cricoarytenoid muscle groups and some other things that actually pull this muscle group together like a rubber band, so to speak, to expand and contract this to create, you know, I don't wanna use the word tension because I don't want you to get the idea that it's tense, but resistance, resistance in this muscle group in order to be able to create sound and rise and come down within sound, which is how we phonate. Go up and down a scale. Well, when I went, as I go up, 
I'm actually creating more resistance in this muscle group with the cricoarytenoid and arytenoid cartilage muscle and sinew structure. Now, there's nine of these and I don't get a chance to go into all of this cartilage stuff. I won't get, I'll, I'll try to do this in a more extensive video for those of you that want a greater breakdown of this stuff. But anyway, I wanna talk about the, the between the larynx, it shoots its way up in through the, amp, this, this amplified sound comes in through our abdominal cavity, the strength in our abdomen. Some say it's the lung and only the lung. I disagree with that. Some say that the diaphragm doesn't matter. I vehemently disagree with that. Even big top vocal coaches don't emphasize this muscle structure at all. Well, good luck with that one because you'll never be able to get really good strength out of the sound and you won't be able to build a strength where you can have a relaxation response where the chest, the neck, and the throat can handle big loads of this explosion of air that keeps happening. So I wanna get into something called the pharynx. What is the pharynx? Well, the pharynx basically is just your throat and the muscle structure that happens within it. So within the, within the larynx, the larynx vibrates through these different parts that we call resonators, okay? And you see resonators, ooh, all this, this term. Within these resonators, there's a component where it comes in, again, from the abdomen and the lung, in through the trachea, right? Out, or should, out, out through the trachea, and it hits these pockets all along the way hits the throat, it hits the velonasal port, which is, which is your nasal cavity, um, your uvula, your tongue, uh, all these different parts in the, in the throat play, a, it's the hard palate, the soft palate, all these things play a, a big role in the color and the phonation and projection or amplification of sound, okay? That's how this all works. So what we do is when I talk about open throat technique, we wanna maximize the amount of space in the throat and I walk you through how each vowel has its own placement. And the coolest thing about this is within that placement, God has given us these, like I call them amphitheaters in the throat, where when we create a certain sound or a certain vowel, it hits a certain beautiful round tone in the vowel where it's not clamped or pinched or squeezed or you know whatever we do to try to squeeze to get sound. When we can relax the throat and create a muscle response that opens up the throat for true open throat technique, we can hit this resonator or this amplification and it buckles and it's not buckle, excuse me. It, um, it curves like this and it throws the sound forward and out and resonates. Okay. Now, by the way, there's another component of this too. And I, this is also very, very important. And that's how much air we use. Ken, you said it's, it's this explosion of air. Oh, it certainly is, but we don't, overuse air because the overuse of air is actually one of the kiss of deaths to the voice. We want to be able to mitigate this air. I cover this in my singing course called How to Sing Better Than Anyone Else, a whole section on glottal compression or hyperglottal compression when you want to compress to a distorted level or a, a, a level that we're kind of distressing the chord a bit. Now, within all of this, okay, God has given, given us like some really cool stuff. The, the, the um, amount of, um, let's call it moisture, because it's the best way I can describe it, that's needed is people will sit there and they'll chug a bunch of water and they'll think they'll, they'll sing a song or a phrase or something, they'll chug a bunch of water and they think that they're moist, uh, getting moisture for the chords, their folds. Wrong, it doesn't actually moisten the chords themselves. Now hydration is awesome and once we hydrate the body, the body itself has an outer lining that goes around the folds themselves called mucosa. And that mucosa can seep in and you'll, if you ever get strobed or if you watch some videos on, on people that get a strobe of their, their vocal folds, you can see the mucosa is sitting on the outside. It actually is like this wet gelatin like thing and it actually lines the whole wall of your throat and other parts of the body. But it, 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 it uh, creates um, the ability to have moisture that re, um, creates resiliency and uh, elasticity back in the cord, which is super awesome. There's something else that the body creates too, which is called glutathione. And glutathione also helps regenerate and uh, re innervate or you know, put back this moisture in the cords and other parts of the body. In fact, I'm gonna talk about glutathione in another subject when I talk about nodes and polyps because that's a big subject. I get this all the time. You know, I think I have a node or I think I have a polyp. I'm gonna do a whole video series, not series, but a whole video on this. So stay tuned for that. But um, anyway, so I'm gonna get back to the epiglottis because we sort of covered a lot of stuff. So we have this buzz of resonator this resonators that happen when we come in from the stomach. Hey, you know, let, let's, by the way, let's do this from the lungs so we can be absurd about this. If I go, hey, 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 right, that small snap of air, remember? Here's the small snap. Hey, 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 hey. That's 
the max I can produce in the lung, right? But if I go, if I go like this, hey, 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 I get this crazy amount of strength from the, from the abdomen, then I can actually be able to control and again, mitigator can, or um, uh, have the color and all these resonators can work to my advantage with how much strength I'm able to create from my whole abdominal cavity. All right, now let's move on. A couple more things. Um, what you guys don't realize too is that as we take on this whole muscle structure and as we think of things in terms, because I'm doing this so you can understand your body, we have to actually break them down in what I call quadrants or sections. And in, in my course, I break down as we take in the breath. We don't necessarily want to take in the breath from the total abdomen. And here's why. It's so closely related, so closely related to the way we normally take a breath that when we do this, that it's very similar to the response that we already have with our lungs as we breathe in and breathe out. Now someone says, well, you already know how to breathe, you know, just breathe. Well, that's kind of moronic, I'm sorry, but it is because there's all kinds of different ways of taking a breath. Let's consider the athlete. You wouldn't tell an athlete who's trying to understand how to get a better breath response, hey, you're gonna run a marathon. Eh, you know, when you talk, you talk, you already know how to breathe. So just kind of run down that street, keep on going, and just let the natural thing happen. It's like, really? Come on, guys. Let's, let's take this seriously here. No, the athlete says, hey, I want to do things to increase lung expansion. I want to be able to um, uh, control enough air in the lung to where I can pace myself for the run or the soccer game or football game or these other things that I'm doing. So we do the same exact thing when we sing. It's not that you already know how to breathe. No, you don't already know how to breathe. People breathe very differently. Right now, if I go, right now, if I was a guy with just a little bit of a timid guy and I'm talking to you like this and I say, yeah, but Ken, you already know how to breathe. So I'm talking to you like this. No, that guy doesn't know how to take a great breath. But I have another guy going, hey man, what's going on? Dude, let's rock! Like you've got this strength, this lion that's roaring in your stomach. Then all of a sudden it's like that guy knows how to breathe if he's doing it right and can control the air, but also control that he's not heating the glottis with too much air to dry out the cords and give it enough time to rejuvenate for the voice. Okay, I know this is a lot of information. I hope this was helpful, but I want to do something here and I wanted to have you guys take a breath. Just take a breath in from the abdomen and go, hey, hey. Hey, hey, and I want you to feel that explosion of air. So the next time you go to sing, you'll understand if I can control this lion that's in my stomach, the engine that drives my car, then I also know that I can control it to with a relaxation response between the chest, the neck, and the throat, and I can learn how to just kill it, whether it's singing light jazz R&B, which it's still needed for that, or something heavy like scream or rock or whatever that is, okay? All right, guys, thank you for joining me, Ken Templin Vocal Academy, where the proof is in the singing. Thunderstruck!